Calcutta Parsi Club welcomes you to Talking Tennis. And who better to talk tennis with than Rico Pepono? Viewers, uh, in Indian tennis, Rico is one of the few, if not the only one, to have had a playing career over two decades, followed by two decades of coaching the best who achieved the best in Indian tennis. But there is more to Rico than tennis, and I wouldn't do an introduction spoiler. Uh, join me and let's find out. So, Rico, thank you for being here. Thank you, Yesdi, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And, uh, of course, uh, I'm grateful to the Calcutta Parsi Club, all my dear friends who are part of that club, great institution. And, of course, uh, a pleasure talking to you, Yesdi. Thank you. Uh, Rico, let's start with, uh, you know, what you started out in life with is being a tennis player. And I really want to talk you through a few aspects of the making of Rio, uh, Rico the tennis player. So to talk through a playing career would take a very long time, over 20 years. But we're going to try and condense it down to uh, a few minutes. When did you first realize uh, you could have and wanted a career in tennis? Well, good question. Uh, you know, I started off playing in the early 70s and uh, that was the time when the South Club was at its peak. Uh, we had some great tennis players at the South Club at the time. Jaydeep Bukaji, Premjit Lal, Akhtar Ali, uh, just naming a few. Chiradeep Bukaji, Bidyut Duswami, our very own Naushar Madden, Cyrus Jr. playing with me. So I, would, I came into a generation of tennis players at the Calcutta South Club who really all made it. They all played professional tennis at some level or the other. So I got a great sort of insight into what is needed to be able to play tennis at a high level. So that was the first sort of motivating factor I had. Second was the fact that Akhtar Ali was our coach at the time. And he had coached a lot of great players before us. And he sort of inspired us as well. And then again, yes, nothing happens in sport without the support of your parents. And... Uh, as a young man growing up in Calcutta, my dad was very instrumental in, in pushing me and taking me to the courts and making sure I got my practice sessions in and really was instrumental in driving me to make that decision to start taking tennis up professionally. Coming back to your question, I guess 1978, you know, it took six, seven years of me playing sub-junior tennis and junior tennis, but it took me to win the Asian junior gold medal at Bangkok was the first sort of indicator that I had that this is what I want to do. And this is something that I'm going to pursue going forward. So maybe possibly that Asian junior gold medal in Bangkok was the, was a catalyst to push me into playing tennis full time. You, you said your parents were, obviously uh, you can't start a career in a sport like tennis in, in those days in the seventies without the support of your parents. 
uh, because sport was not meant to be a career for most people. Uh, but other than other than your parents, who were your biggest influences on the court and off the court in your formative years uh, as a tennis player? Well, I'll give you a little reference to your question first. I commentated quite a bit with Vijay Amritraj. And Vijay told me in 1971, he was the only professional athlete out of India. So 71, 72, I was 11, 12 years old, just coming up at the time. And he was the only one playing professional tennis, uh, playing professional sport. Even Suryal Gavaskar at that time was employed by Nirlons, earning probably 100 rupees a test match. So put that in perspective. So you want to think about playing professional sport at that time was a very, very sort of tall order. So I guess the support of my parents, one, was very important. Second of all, I had some lots of great influences at the Calcutta South Club. First, my coach, Mr. Akhtar Ali, he taught me the nuances of the game, he taught me my technique. And besides that, I got to sit over there and watch some world-class tennis players playing every single afternoon. And I got to learn a lot from them. People like Premjit Lal, Jadeep Mukherjee, Naresh Kumar, uh, Chiradeep Mukherjee, Bidyut Goswami, Naushar, all the, all, Naushar Madden, all these guys were my seniors. And uh, they used to be practicing on court one, two, and three. We were the sub-juniors on courts five and six. We couldn't even get a chance to play anyway on the, on the early courts because these great guys were there practicing every single day. People like A.C. Khan, you know, all regular good tennis players ranked in India, ranked in the world, playing tennis in front of your eyes. Yeah. So they, were great, they were great influences because they really, that changing room, again, coming into that changing room, listening to them talk, discussing the game. So all that I learned and everything that I picked up were the small nuances and, and conversations and watching them practice that really drove me to trying to achieve what I did achieve. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, earlier whilst you were talking, you made a reference to when you were 12 years old and I'd like to jog your memory a little bit. At the age of 12, you won a certain tournament playing a certain Parsi at the Saturday club. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it was actually one of my first... Actually, I started playing tennis in the winter uh, in Calcutta. And then as a family, we used to move to Bangalore. So I went to Bangalore in the summer, continued playing tennis and uh, got a lot better playing at the Bangalore club. I played a couple of tournaments in Bangalore. But when I returned to Calcutta, I, that was my first tournament early in Calcutta, the under-14 event at the Saturday club. And I came up against a certain Cyrus J. Madden in the final. I won, I won the first set. The second set, he blanked me six love. And then we had a tussle in the third, on which I eventually managed to pull off 9-7. So that was my first major success of the, in the tennis court, on the tennis court. And, and I think Cyrus was definitely part of that. Yeah, well, uh, Cyrus too has fond memories of that. About uh, last week, he had a little chat show with uh, somebody you and I know very well, Numi Mehta. And uh, he mentioned this and I was chuckling to myself because I said, well, I'm going to be mentioning this on my chat with Rico as well. <laughs> so. Well, it's very, definitely very relevant uh, at the end of the day. You know, Cyrus comes from a great uh, tennis family. You know, both his uncle played tennis for India and his, and his cousin Naushir was a fine tennis player. So Cyrus has really come from a great uh, tennis heritage. So it's hey. wonderful to have. And he continues to play. I know he plays with all of you regularly. Yeah. And a uh, very, very regular tennis player. It's quite amazing. He can be off the court for three months. He'll come back and still blast serves as if he's just been playing yesterday. So, you know. And besides, you guys share another love, which is for horse racing. But we won't go there right now. We'll save that for later. Um, Rico, what were the playing highlights of your career? Well, uh, there were a few. First of all, uh, I guess winning that gold medal at uh, the Asian Juniors was definitely the first one. And then uh, the Asian Games silver medal in New Delhi. A little unfortunate. We were a little unfortunate to lose in the final in the doubles. But uh, I had a slight, uh, no excuses, but I definitely did have a sort of a stomach bug going into that final. And that definitely affected the way I, I sort of performed. I had no choice. We were playing the so, Nandan Bal and myself. Uh, 
I guess the uh, one big match comes to my memory, the fact when I was playing an Andres Weissand of Russia in the semi-finals of the senior nationals on, on the loans of the Calculus South Club. I was down two sets to love. I was down three love. It was the best of five set match. I was down two sets to love and three love in the third. Came back, won the third. And in those days, you got a 10 minute break between after the third set. So I went in the locker room, had a quick shower, came out, went down three love again in the fourth. Came back, won that, and eventually beat him 6 2 in the fifth. So definitely, that was one of my big, big, big uh, sort of uh, big wins. He was a top 100 player at the time. He was playing professional tennis out of Russia. And he and uh, another guy called Andrei Olovsky had come down to play in the Nationals at that time. So definitely, those were, that was definitely one of my big, big wins of my career. I beat a guy called Shlomo Glickstein, who was top 50 in the world. I beat him in a challenger in Hilversum in Holland. Uh, another big uh, sort of uh, scalp in my playing career. And I think uh, Nandan and I had great success in doubles. Unfortunately, we never took it to the ATP Tour. But uh, we, we were eight times national doubles champions, senior doubles champions. Pretty much unbeaten 10 good years in Indian tennis. And uh, unfortunately, I, I do regret the fact that I did not ever get to play a Davis Cup tie for India. But I guess playing at that time in the Davis Cup was extremely tough. We had a very, very tough team. Vijay Amit Raj, Anand Amit Raj, Ramesh Krishnan, uh, Shashi Menon. There were a lot of very, it's a very tough team to break into. I did get into the squad a couple of times, but I never got to play. Mm. So, Rico, uh, you know, 20 years of a tennis career, and all of a sudden, you switch to coaching. And yeah, that sort of fell in my lap, ESD. Ah. So, it was, it, it was a, did you at some point in your career say, I'm going to be a coach? Any events that triggered it? How did you take that decision? Because it's such a huge decision. And I know you were very successful at it. And we'll come to that later. But let's talk about how that decision happened and, you know, what, what brought you into coaching? Yeah, it's a very funny story. In fact, uh, I was playing a tournament in Delhi at the Delhi Gym, which I actually won a men's tournament. And I remember Leander was uh, just out of bat. He had gone to the games in Nagasaki I think in Japan they had come back and he lost to me there in the semi-finals and uh, on the flight back from, from Delhi his father Dr. West Pace was sitting next to me and he sort of sort of popped the question he said you know Rico you're 30 now would you be interested in becoming a coach and I said you know this is a of it he said listen Leander needs someone to guide him in the next couple of years and no, who better than you? You know, he's very fond of you. You all are very comfortable with each other. He respects the fact that you probably might, pretty much saw him as a young kid growing up at the Calcutta South Club. So would you consider it? So I gave it a thought. I talked to my wife about it. And so therefore, for the next year and a half or so, I not only started coaching him, I actually started playing with him. I started playing doubles with him, helping him uh, uh, win a couple of satellite events in doubles, get himself an ATP ranking. And then uh, the rest was history, you know, and he went on to do such great things post that. So I think I definitely was a very important part in, in Leander's life because at the end of the day, when he came out of bat, he really had no one to turn to. And, uh, and really, West did not have the funds to send him abroad to anybody at that time. So it was a very, very uh, opportune time for me too because I got to work with probably the best tennis player India has seen in a long time. That's true. Very true. And the guy still carries on. I don't know how he does it. Uh, I admire him. Uh, Rico, uh, there was a time when uh, you see this background, my Zoom background, it's got all these many, many photographs that you sent to me and I decided to use it as a poster. And I sent you a copy of it. I don't know if you looked at it, but there is one picture in there that is missing and it's missing because I wanted to keep it out of there and focus on it separately. And it represents uh, one of the biggest highlights of your coaching career. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm going to show you that picture and then you can build the, you know, use that as a hub and build your coaching story around it. And let's see where that goes. So hold on.
here it is can you see that rico yeah yes d uh, this was on the steps of the all england club the year was 1999 right and the indian express that is leander pace and mahesh bhupathi played the finals at wimbledon winning in four sets so that is probably the highlight of my coaching career sitting on those steps of wimbledon having that trophy on my head yeah for for a tennis aficionado like me who followed tennis for a very very long time this represented to me uh you know the the best the very best of indian tennis uh at that time and it was a good yeah. period and you were involved in it so tell us more about it yeah it was a great year with 1999 we were we were pretty much on top of our game at the time both leander and mahesh were combining phenomenally the year started with the australian open where they reached they reached the finals and they lost in a great you know this match is i had seen and uh, they lost 7-5 in the fifth i remember i had invited chiradeep mukherjee and his wife leslie to watch it with us in the box and it was one of very one of the most exciting matches on center court at the australian open that year post that we came to the french uh, leander and mahesh were unbeatable there they won they won the french in pretty much decisive uh, form and from there we moved to wimbledon and at wimbledon you know it's very different for us indians because you know we grew up in a in a sort of environment in our sport where we believe the mecca of the sport our game was wimbledon we dreamt to play wimbledon we dreamt to be at wimbledon we dreamt that the all england club was the ultimate and uh, i know it was a very emotional time for both leander and mahesh because i know how important it was for both of them the, the fact that they were going to win their first wimbledon title and it was a very sort of bizarre sort of day you know we we, we they were playing a very tough match and what happened was they got a rain delay and they were pretty much struggling they lost the first set and when they came into the locker room i know mahesh was playing on one leg he had pulled a you know his hamstring was very tight he was he was struggling to push any weight off it and you know he was almost he was in tears so i had to sort of sit with him and uh, you know kind of give him the confidence to go out there with the physios working on his leg and i think that was the most important 10 15 minutes that i spent with mahesh in his playing career because if i wasn't there i don't know whether he would be able to bounce back but they came back they played pretty much awesome tennis they beat palmer and o'brien they played amazing tennis they came and won in four sets and mahesh really needed a like a month off post that just to get over that injury so it was a very very exciting day for us you know and uh, you see that photograph post that we had an amazing party at uh, the place where we were staying at it was one of the few times we got you know a lot of generations of great indian tennis players and the photograph in the background again of joydeep naresh ramesh vijay anand mahesh leander asif ismail was in town at the time we had invited him so we had this wonderful evening post that wimbledon victory which was i think the sweetest of all the four grand slam finals of each that year Well, that's a uh, you know that's an amazing story. I, but I have a question for you from that era, and I've been dying to ask it for the last thirty years. And I found I thought of it this morning. I said, Rico is the best person to ask this question. How did Leander and Mahesh develop this chest bump at the end of their game? Is it just something that happened? They planned it. Somebody advised them. I mean, tell us the backstory on that. Well, I don't think there's much of a backstory. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I think it just it, it just happened. You know, they were out there, and all of a sudden, Leander jumped in the air, and Mahesh met him in the air with his chest, and then it became a sort of signature thing. Every time they won a big point, and a lot of other players then started following them. I know Mike and Bob Bryan started doing a lot of it. Exactly. I thought that they should have patented that. You know, you can pay a greeting and. Yeah, because the Brand brothers then took it, and nobody remembers that it's actually Pace and Bhupati that started that. That's right. It was definitely Mahesh and Leander who started it. Right. And I remember, I remember just before U.S. Open one year, 
Leander was injured, so Mahesh played doubles with Mike Bryan. And uh, because Bob was injured and they won the tournament, they won the Hamlet Cup. And I remember them chest bumping and kind of looking at me and sort of smiling every time they did it. So, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a story. So, yeah, I have a question for you uh, because you've seen uh, and, and you, you know, I think you're one of the luckiest guys to have seen two of the best doubles teams of probably all time, barring McEnroe and anybody else. Uh, you know, when you look at the Bryan brothers and you look at Pays and Bhupati in their different combinations, I'm not sure that they played each other very often to have a meaningful rivalry, uh, if at all. But how do you compare their games? I mean, you know, Bob and Mike and Leander and Mahesh, two the, you know, couldn't find four more different types of people. Well, yes, to answer your question, we'll have to add one more team to this, uh, the Woodies. Both yeah. Todd Woodbridge and uh, Mark Woodford were a phenomenal doubles team. And I think Mahesh and Leander learned a lot from the fact of watching the Woodies play. And uh, all three teams had their strengths and their weaknesses. You know, we as coaches had to find the, the strengths and the weaknesses and explain to our players what they needed to do. But at the bottom line is they, were, they, were, they complemented each other so well. And what I mean by that is Leander was awesome at the net. Mahesh was awesome off the return. So these were two very, very important aspects of why they gelled as a phenomenal doubles team. And I guess with Mike and Bob Bryan, they sort of played doubles a different, differently. Mike Bryan being the right-hander played on the ad court and Bob Bryan being the left-hander played on the deuce court, which was, you know, something that they did, which not normal doubles players do. Normally, if you're left-handed, you will play the left court. But they sort of changed that around. But then again, they complemented each other really well. They both were excellent volleyers at the net. You know, at the end of the day, to be a good doubles player, you've got to be good at the net. And uh, both Mark, Mike and Bob Bryan were brilliant at the net. They played percentage doubles. They made those first returns. They made those first volleys. And at the end of the day, to be a good doubles player, yes, the most important thing is to hit the ball in the right place. Yes. It is the, the precision of putting that volley or putting that first return low, down at his feet or into the open court. It was all about putting that ball in the right place. And let me tell you, these three teams were phenomenal at doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I've got to tell you that uh, the couple of times that I was lucky enough to be on the same side of the court of you, uh, as you as in South Club, I understood the value of positioning and what you're just saying. So... Yeah, um, and that was terrific. I, I, I think your coaching career is really, uh, you know, sort of underlined and signature of those four Grand Slam doubles and the time that you spent with the Indian Express. Um, that's a highlight, uh, I think, of your career. And what, what other coaching uh, achievements would you sort of bring, to, uh, bring together, um, you know, Along with that, if I may say, uh, you know, I, I stopped coaching the Davis Cup team in the year 2000 and then uh, took up Indian women's tennis. And we had a young girl at that time who was 14 years old by uh, name of Sania Mirza. And uh, I watched her practice with me in the Fed, uh, in a Fed Cup training in, in Delhi. And I remember going back on the tour and telling Mahesh and Leander that this girl probably hits a forehand harder than both you guys. So, so they were pretty disappointed to hear that. But, uh, but uh, to prove that, I know she came to play the juniors at the French Open that year. And uh, I asked them to come and watch her have a practice session. And uh, I trust me, they were both pretty impressed. She hit that very heavy, unorthodox sort of forehand, hit it, caught it a little late, used her wrist. So not very orthodox. But at the end of the day, it was extremely effective. And I think I did have a role to play in her life in the sense is I sort of brought my experience of coaching to her. I kind of taught her the nuances of, you know, she, I think she was fortunate to have me sitting in the chair when she was playing a lot of the Fed Cup. We did a lot. She won a, she won a few medals in the Asian Games and the Commonwealth Games and all that. And I was always in the chair when she played these big matches. So I think I, there were a lot of insights that I managed to share with her and I'm sure she carried them forward as she developed and became a far better tennis player. Never really traveled with her. She did ask me, in fact, to go on the road with her a couple of times. 
But you know, ESD, after what I had done with Leander and Mahesh, you know, eight, nine years on the tour, it was, it was starting to get to me traveling. And, uh, you know, I had young kids and I know my wife was sort of bringing them up by herself. So I really decided post Mahesh and Leander, post the time of me traveling with Mahesh, I stopped in the end, middle of 2003. And that was it. I really didn't want to sort of travel full time anymore. You, you know, most viewers don't know or, or don't recall that you actually coached the Indian Davis Cup team for 10 years, if I remember rightly. Absolutely. And uh, you know, those 10 years, we had some amazing Davis Cup results. Talk us through a couple of them. Well, the first one that comes to your mind is the fact that uh, we traveled to France in 1993 to play a world group quarterfinal tie against France. We had beaten Switzerland and Calcutta in the, in the earlier round that qualified us for the quarterfinals of the world group. It was July, I remember, my son was just born in the US and uh, I had traveled across from New York to Nice and we got into training. We were in training for two, two and a half weeks. Naresh Kumar, our captain, myself, and of course our two singles players who played Leander Pace and Ramesh Krishnan. It was a phenomenal Davis Cup tie ESD. And according to me, it is the highlight of Indian Davis Cup uh, success for two reasons. One is the fact we were such underdogs. We were playing on slow clay courts in France. Nobody gave us any chance. They had two players in the top 20 of the world, Henri Leconte and Arnold Bouch. And uh, we were like, you know, we were considered 100 to 1 outsiders. But the tennis that our boys were able to produce in those three days were phenomenal. Leander's match against Arnold Bush on the first day, where he took him and beat him. Sorry, the first day he played Henri Leconte. And he, to beat Henri Leconte in France on clay was a phenomenal achievement. And uh, it was a possessed Leander pace, you know, the absolute possessed Leander pace that day. So we eventually won it on the, in the fifth tie. Ramesh beat Rudolf Gilbert because Lacan said he was injured and didn't play the fifth tie. On Monday morning, because we could not complete it on Sunday, it ended 7-5 in the fifth. Leanne, uh, Ramesh Krishnan coming and winning the last two games on a Monday afternoon. So that is probably the highlight of my, tennis, of my coaching career in Davis Cup. But we had some phenomenal wins. We beat uh, Switzerland, we beat Britain, we beat South Africa, we beat uh, uh, Chile in Delhi. We played a great match against uh, the great Peter Korda and the Czech team in, and in, in Fibram in, in uh, the Czech Republic. We played a fabulous Davis Cup tie against Britain in Nottingham, where both Leander and Mahesh made us really proud. So, you know, it, it's been an incredible, it was an incredible seven, eight, nine years of incredible Davis Cup in the, one, in the world group. That was a big stage of Davis Cup for us, I think. Yeah, you know, you know uh, as part of the show, I was doing a bit of research and actually came across that 1991 French Dav uh, Davis Cup time in France and I was watching Leander and it immediately struck me and after all these years, it struck me that what Leander actually has is what I call the... Calcutta Moidan spirit, you know, Charbona. I mean, I won't let it go. I'll get it. And, you know, that was an amazing uh, spirit that I felt that the team had as a whole. And, you know, do you think that that was, you know, that not letting it go and, you know, hanging on to it, was that something that worked for the players? Yeah, he was our talisman, really. And, uh, you know, what he did on the court sort of reflected on how the team sort of could behave there. But again, two things are very important here. One is we had two amazing captains in through those times. One is Naresh Kumar. Uh, and I'll, why I say two amazing captains? Because they're both, and Jaydeep Mukherjee. Because both of them were such different human beings. Yeah. Their personalities were so different. One was the fact that Naresh was very sort of serious and uh, he had everything down to pat to the minute you wanted us to do what he wanted us to do. He was very sort of team oriented. And he's kept us focused for those two and a half weeks in a very sort of disciplinarian manner. While Jadip was a more of a happy-go-lucky sort of guy who sent his matches across with a little more relaxed sort of way. And the, but they both seemed to work. The boys played incredible tennis under them. And the fact remains that Indian Davis Cup at that, that era was 
was was was probably like I said the finest era in Indian Davis Cup for a very very long time. I I was uh, you know Jaydeep is a laugh a minute guy. Whenever you talk to him about tennis, you know I, I can never stop grinning or smiling when he's talking. And I always wanted to know you know I, when you watch Ramesh Krishnan uh, slice backhand that slice backhand. What I remember of Jaydeep's career, his slice backhand was one of the best. And the, how much of that technical know-how passes through from coach to player in in the course of the relationship? Oh, it's very important. I think that's the, that's key because at the end of the day, it's you pick the right shot at the right time. And I think uh, that's what we all learned very earlier in our careers in South Club. And I think even Leander benefited from that because he used to get to watch his genera- next generation playing. So he used to watch me, uh, Zishan, and all these guys playing and practicing. So really, our nuances, what we did in certain situations on the court, were all sort of flashbacks to what we learned from our predecessors. And I think that's what really caused our downfall in Indian, men, in Indian tennis. You know, end of the day, our approaching programs are very sort of self in one center. So all the players sort of met and played. At least for Calcutta, I can talk. You see, there's so many social clubs in Calcutta, all have tennis courts. But the serious tennis was played at the Calcutta South Club. It was not played at the Saturday Club. It was not played in Tolly. It was not played in the other clubs where CCFC, where they have tennis courts. There were a lot of juniors playing out of those clubs, but they never matched anything near to what we played at the Calcutta South Club. So I think, you know, these sort of this sort of, you know, presence of these senior players has a huge impact on the guy actually playing. So coaches handing over captains in Davis Cup, you know, the sort of experiences they share with the players, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that through all those generations. And, you know, it's, it's a sort of a knowledge transfer that goes on or a torch passed from one generation to the next, which is... Some of the good things about Indian tennis, unfortunately, we don't have those now. But you know, tennis has changed so much and I want to sort of move along and, and pick your brain of, you know, 20 years of playing and 20 years of coaching and commentating. Tennis has changed. You started in the era of the wooden racket and probably a continental grip, more than most ATP players have currently. So, so many changes took place in equipment and techniques during your playing career and your coaching career. How did you adapt as Rico? I mean, how did you adapt? Good question. See, at the end of the day, we started playing with our wooden rackets. And you said Eastern forehand grip, uh, Eastern and a bit of a backhand grip where you moved your grip a little bit. But at the end of the day, continental grip was something was most of the players were using at the time. You know, it was one grip, you didn't need to change it. You could hit your backhand and forehand pretty much alike. And then the adverse grips started coming, the semi-Western and then the Western grips. Now, what happens is when you hold a Western grip, it pretty much takes away the fact that you don't volley that well anymore because you've got to really, if you're holding your grip, you've got to kind of come right from the underneath to the top to be able to hit a vo- to hold it like a club, to be able to hit a volley. So that is where tennis sort of revolutionized. People were not coming to the net anymore because it was getting difficult holding those grips to be able to transition to a net sort of player. So serve and volley was starting to start to disappear. And what happened was with this advent of this, the racket got a lot more powerful. The graphite racket is a very, very powerful racket. I'm probably serving at 51. Probably I can serve a tennis ball today much quicker than what I served during my playing career. So the racket is so different today. So what happens is basically the tennis player got very much fitter. He got to be able to run down every single ball that was hit on the court, which unlike the players in the past, see, the players in the past had a a play was to chip and charge, to chip, come in, put the pressure on your opponent to make that passing shot. Today, the players, yes, they are so phenomenally fit that they're on the full run. They're so balanced. You watch them, they take... 12, 14 steps out wide, and still that balance is dead on. So the technique is not compromised. So the passing shot has now become so much easier than what it was before. Right. And end of the day, the chip and charge pretty much disappeared from the game. Roger Federer still uses it once in a while, but he uses it as a mix-up. He can't use it regularly because once you start doing that all the time, 
you're going to be finding your balls whizzing past you both on both flanks. <laughs> so, you know, tennis has changed from that point of view. I think for the fact that one is the grips have changed phenomenally. And second of all, the fitness of the players today. It is just phenomenal. They are, can hit. I remember watching a Kanyas, a guy called Giannimo Kanyas from, from Chile. A practice session. Mahesh and I just finished a practice session in Monte Carlo on one of the outside courts. And then I watched his coach actually come and do an hour with him. And we were sitting on the side just watching. We had nothing else to do. We were just stretching. Do you know that coach had 200 balls in a hopper. He stood in, he stood in the net and he just moved Kanya side to side till that 200 balls ran out. Then they picked them up and they went back to doing the same thing. So that is the sort of grind that you got to put yourself through. You know, when you sit and watch the French Open, which is starting in a couple of weeks, in a couple of days on Monday, just watch and you know, observe this, Yazdi, that when these guys are on the full run, how balanced they are. Yeah. And it comes from the fact of just repetition of hitting a lot of balls, you know, corner to corner. And that is what the game's all about today. Till you watch it live, you don't realize how hard they're hitting it, number one. And number two is how quick they become. And I think, you know, that is something that television sort of misses. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. I've been very fortunate in watching the Dubai Open for 14 years, the Indian Wells last year, uh, the ATP finals in, in London over three times. And I, I fully agree. I mean, on TV, you just don't get that same feeling. I mean, particularly when people watch uh, Nadal, you know, I said, you have no idea what it looks like in real life, you know. I mean, I'd need a ladder to get to, to one of his balls. I mean, that's how it jumps. The guy hits at 5,000 RPM. Yeah, I, I remember taking Samira, my wife. Uh, we were at, uh, in England in 2014. And he was playing Nicholas Kiefer, a good friend of mine, in the first round of Wimbledon. So I got a, a couple of center court tickets. And the first thing Samira noticed was, she said, my God, I can't, it does, doesn't occur to me how far back he's standing to return serve. And that, and that too on grass, you yeah. know. You know, putting that RPM into perspective, a BMW 520i has a maximum RPM of 8,000. So, <laughs> Rafael Nadal is hitting about 70% of the revolutions per minute you would get if you started your BMW 520i. I mean, Mind-boggling. I, I, I can't get over that. You can imagine what a toll is taking on his body. So it's quite incredible that he's been able to go on for so long. Uh, that, that's uh, something else. But you know, I, I've got to say that uh, we probably lived through uh, the most interesting era of men's tennis with uh, Fedra Nadal, Djokovic, and even Murray. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Warrenka and Del Potro. And I, I don't think we'd ever see that sort of uh, collection of individuals at the top of men's tennis, uh, you know. For quite yeah, we've been, we've been very fortunate. We've had, the, we've had this most incredible era. You know, when, when the Sampras Agassi eras were starting to come to an end, you wondered who will be next. And these guys really stepped it up. And they've taken tennis to such an incredible level, you know. They've yeah. taken level, tennis to an... In, like Tiger Woods did in, in golf. They've, they've, he's really, they've really raised the bar. And uh, that's why this generation of Zverev, Thiem, uh, Medvedev are struggling to get to that level. They're, they're still not at that level. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The bar is very high. So Rico brings me into what I call my uh, selfish segment of the program, which is double stims. And, uh, you know, most of us doubles hackers at the club level. We watch higher level doubles on TV and wonder if we are playing the same game. I mean, so, you know, I say it's now time for Masterclass Rico. How should we doubles guys at club level play? <laughs> Educate us. And believe me, I got a bunch of 20 uh, Calcutta Parsi Club tennis players who are watching this, uh, if not more, and probably a lot of members of South Club, etc. So, you know, take it away. Well, first of all, I would suggest is don't follow these modern doubles players because they play a different sort of doubles today than what you guys play at the club level. That's where it's changed. The, 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 the doubles players of the past, if you watch Leander being probably the last guy, plays the sort of doubles that a, a club player would like to play. He likes to have a blocked return. He likes to have that chip off the backhand, drop it down at, at the opponent's feet when he's coming into the net. 
and they you know get your first serve in so that gives you time to get to the net to make that first volley or get your first serve in and stay back and give yourself a chance to be able to be aggressive with that first ground stroke the doubles player the modern doubles player this is the last few years it's all become power they hit their first serve you know we were told we were taught i know i was taught by after ali to play good doubles you must get your first serve in that means you must take something off it you must get to the net get close enough to make that first volley when you're over the service line that means you got to be quick enough to get there thirdly make that volley into back back to the opponent on the baseline try and keep that ball away from the person at the net because it's very easy if you go straight to the person in the net he'll just reflex the volley past you so these were the things we were taught but that is all all changed they are now coming out there hitting their first serve at 130 miles an hour if they get it in they win the point if they don't get it in they're hitting a second serve at 110 112 so they're not holding back no holds barred doubles anymore they don't depend they're not trying to win the point at the net we used to try and win the point at the net the whole idea of playing doubles and I, even for doubles players like you at the club level is trying to get yourself to the net keep the ball away from the person at the net get it to the guy on the baseline get in and make that first volley into the open space that should be your mindset but modern tennis in doubles does not that does not arise anymore they just blast it through you if you are standing at the net they think you're a target and they're going to hit the ball so hard straight at you and if you're not ready to hit that reflex volley you're going to spray the ball all over the place so that is where doubles has changed and let me tell you the woodies the indian express the brians they played a lot of percentage doubles which i don't see in the modern i was watching the us open and watching these guys suarez and pavic and all these guys play if sort of change the mindset on doubles yeah. you know it's, it's all about you know hitting that big first serve making that first return and you know service breaks are so sort of die, come one in a million now because you know, with the racket the rack serve is so powerful so you got to you know you could just every doubles match now revolves around one or two crucial points at four all or five all that's why doubles has changed yeah well uh, to conclude that segment let me tell you the last exponent of chip and charge is to be found uh, with a person known to both of us Cyrus Madden he's the only one i know now who actually chips and charges and i can't stand back i stand back and watch that happen and admire it because i something i could never do that guy still keeps doing it so one of these days i'm going to video him i'm going to get you and him on a court video both of you digital history yep chip and charge that was your board up in the kagra south club to do right so rico i uh, want to come to uh, go is go away from tennis a bit rico you are a man uh, who is is associated with tennis but there's so much more to you uh, you're a man who gives love to animals uh, you establish a tennis trust uh, at a very mature stage in your life and you've embarked on something that i consider so vital and essential to indian sport and that is sports management so i'd like to cover all these three uh subjects and let's start with your love for animals doggies and horses are a part of your life uh, doggies are a part of our life too in this house uh, what do you do uh, how do you do it uh, what does it mean to you it means the world to me as we i i sort of i got a labrador you know i stopped traveling in 2003 my labrador cleo came into my life in 2004 and uh, that sort of love for the, for the for the dog was just it just grew on me post that and uh, i was you know as a youngster growing up in hastings we had a we had a dog at home but you know i was not so crazy about dogs at that time but this sort of cleo sort of her coming into my life really changed that and from that point of view you know i sort of started taking care of the stray dogs in our on our in our street in our neighborhood on the race course where i go so it sort of grew on me and uh, i've sort of tried to do my best to look after them and give them a good life and to make sure that they are comfortable so that continues that will never stop i you know like like sanam does i am also uh, one of those crazy advocates for stray animals and especially dogs and uh, that is due to the fact that my labrador taught me so much about the love and affection 
and the sort of loyalty that they give and share with you. With regards to my trust, it was something that, uh, you know, in 2010, I remember the Commonwealth Games that just finished in Delhi and I was in a little bit of my crossroads in my life. I really didn't know what I wanted to do for any further. I've done so much of, you know, what I've done, like you said. And my wife said to me, why don't you start something in Calcutta which is meaningful? And that was the first time it occurred to me that, you know, it's about time that I start giving back. And uh, I got so much out of this wonderful game. And so I did two things I did. One is I got Shyandev Chakravarti to come back from Kuwait. I wanted him to head my coaching program. And I got a guy called Shane Niss to head my training for my fitness for my kids. So but I got these two guys on board. And what we did was I formed a trust. And it's called the Enrico Piperno Tennis Trust. And where I started, I identified three or four youngsters who I saw and picked through the uh, junior circuit. And sort of mentor, I mentor them, shine their coaches them, Shane used to work on their fitness. And we were fortunate enough, like our first batch of four or five kids, Sanil Jaktiani went on to play Junior Davis Cup. Ishak Iqbal became a top 10 men's player in the country. A girl called Yubrani Banerjee today is a top 10 women's player in our country. So these are the sort of three or four kids who were, our, who were in 2012 were the beginning of what we wanted to do. Was basically give them a future in tennis. And fortunate enough, I was able to raise some funds for them. I've been, I've had a lot of philanthropists come out, friends of mine through the racing fraternity, the tennis fraternity, who have been very, very kind in supporting what I do with my trust. With racing, I, you know, I grew up in a racing family. Uh, racing has been part of my blood, horse racing. Uh, I love the sport. I'm one of those, you know, if I'm passionate about it. I love the race horse. I love the horse. And I both, again, Cyrus and I share this. We administer horse racing in Calcutta to the yep. best of our ability. And it's always given me a great thrill. Coming back to the, another very important aspect of what I do today regarding sports management. I run a tennis program at a tennis school in Bangalore called the Jane International. And it was uh, there where I, Wing Commander Aurajit Ghosh, very dear friend of mine, ran the sports program there. And he and I used to call of he played Ranji Trophy cricket for, for, for the services. And both Aurajit and I were very sort of keen that, you know, we thought this, this whole IPL uh, sort of uh, progress that is given other sports, you know, IPL was probably the catalyst for the leagues in tennis, badminton, kabaddi, boxing, table tennis. You know, so I felt we needed a lot of more sports administrators to come out into from India. So I found a lot of these leagues were being run by people, by IMG, for example, who are hiring foreigners to come and do the, do the sort of work which Indians could have done. So the idea was to try and get some sports administrators, teach them sports and management. So we sort of went to this institute in Mysore called SDMIMD, who uh, a lady there, the dean over there, Dr. Gayatri, was very sort of supportive. She thought it was a great idea. And that was the beginnings of what we've done. We've had three batches come through that program. And let me tell you, yes, the, the surprising part is we've been able to place 100% of our graduates. Now, that has, been, that has been our biggest success because we found jobs for these people in Adidas, in Puma, in uh, the Prakash Padukone uh, Academy, in JSW, which runs an amazing program with the Bangalore FC. In, in institutes like the Royal Challengers, Bangalore. So we've been able to place a lot of these uh, graduates coming out of our program, SDMIMD, which has given us a great thrill. Uh, Rico, I, uh, I, I know you and I talked about this and I, and I said, you know, sports management is a, uh, the underserved discipline in this country. And uh, with uh, the vast domain of sports in this country and even worldwide, uh, this is a career path for many youngsters and it is no less than business because it is the business of sports. You're managing a sport from a commercial perspective as well as from an operational perspective. And uh, I think we, what you're doing is something excellent and, and, and I wish you every success in that. And I don't know, uh, you know, how do we get, you know, I've always felt that Calcutta, we just don't have this 
uh, you know, we don't have an academy like uh, the uh, Gopi Chan's academy. I was hoping and wishing that you can actually somehow make your trust into a replica of that for tennis. That because you're already doing so much in mentoring. I hate to use the term academy when I refer to your operation. Uh, I look at it as a tennis trust because it's more stewardship, it's more encouragement and mentoring of players. So I don't know what we can do to bring all this into Calcutta, but you know, the younger kids who are watching this program, sports management is a career path and a very rewarding one at that. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to contact us after watching this program, I'll be sure to get you in touch with Rico. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for our youngsters in the Eastern India, or whoever watching this program, if you want a career in sport, you know, you've played sport, you've not been able to probably play sport at a professional level. This may be a great opportunity for you to be involved. You know, there are a lot of franchises available in India today, in cricket, in, in hockey, in uh, Kabaddi, in uh, so many different sports, which you can be part of and you can actually enjoy a sporting experience through your career. And like, what can be more rewarding? You play sport, you probably could not be able to play it professionally. And you can be, like you said, in the commercial part of running sport, which will probably be the next best option. So those are now available. We have a new program opening in Mysore with the St. Philomena's College there too. We got our second program starting this year. So a lot of opportunity in sports management. So I reach out to any youngsters wanting to do this, to come out and, uh, you know, be part of uh, this new generation of Indians. Yeah, and I would, uh, I, I would hope, expect and really uh, wish that, you know, uh, a corporate in Eastern India actually picks this up as something as part of their corporate social responsibility. Uh, yes. It, yes. See, as you're talking about opening something in Eastern India, it's all, you know, it's got to do with finance at the end of the day, to be able to sort of generate that sort of finance to support these kids. So at the end of the day, you know, when my first kids started going and playing tennis in Europe, they were coming back, they were giving me bills of uh, stringing a racket cost $25. Now, $25 into rupees, you know, if you convert, is, is not a small amount of money. You string a racket in Calcutta for a couple of hundred trips, rupees. So, you know, these are some things that sponsors don't seem to understand. You see, to achieve in tennis, you've got to go, for, go to the next level. You've got to go out and play professional tennis out of the country. Right. And, you know, juniors especially, they need, you know, just playing amongst themselves in Asia doesn't, doesn't make them tennis players. They've got to go to Europe. They need to go to the US. They need to compete at the highest level. And that costs money. Nothing's cheap anymore. So, you know, it's all about what sort of money that is able to generate you see, unfortunately, our associations, you know, they do a good job in organizing tournaments and putting junior tournaments together. But the associations, if they have a weakness, is the fact that they've not been able, they've not been able to build up a corpus to be able to support a kid post 16 or 17. Is that corpus is, you know, I'm able to take my kids in the trust right up to about 15 or 16 myself. But I don't have that sort of wherewithal to test them beyond that. That is where, it is where we are all hurting. So like you said, we need a big corporate to come out with a big CSR budget to say, listen, this is what we've got. This is what is available to us. This is who, who, who are the deserving kids we need to give this money to. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, when I see the sums of money being spent on buying Mohan Bagan East Bengal or any other franchise or whatever, and I kind of feel that, you know, why can't some of this be diverted to creating a tennis infrastructure and what better place to uh, to uh, do it than Calcutta because you know uh, even though it's no longer relevant but we are have been the tennis mecca of India for a very long time. Uh, yes, and, yes you're right and I think that is where we've gone we've sort of slipped into the background. Yeah and, and I wish better days come ahead and better times come ahead for the game in this country. And uh, Rico, people like you are uh, committed to the cause of both tennis and uh, sports management, both of which are very relevant and required in this country. I wish you the very best. And uh, Rico, it's always a pleasure talking to you. 
Uh, I can go on talking to you and we can talk about tennis uh, until five o'clock at least this evening before we retire for a drink. Yeah. I think we need to stop now before my producer bounces me off the show. All right. Just a couple of things just before we end. I'd like to acknowledge a few people who have been very instrumental in my lifetime. Sure. And at the end, I thought I would like to say thank you to them. I'd like to thank my dad for a start. He yeah. was very instrumental in pushing me to play the sport. Uh, I'd like to thank my mom. She maintained all my records. Actually, still, I still have records yesterday of every tournament I played. I won 100 men's tournaments in India. 100. Wow. And I, have, I can give you a quarterfinal, semifinal, final result of every single match of those. And that was helped a lot by my mom. And post that, my wife took on the mantle of doing that. Samira was a great support. Without her, I could not have done what I've done, allowing me to travel, raise the kids by herself. Yeah. Did an incredible yeah. job. And from the tennis perspective, you know, Akhtar Ali, he taught me how to play the game. Eternally grateful. Had two amazing captains, Narish Kumar and Jaidi Pukhuji. I learned so much from them. Yeah. And of course, I like, will not forget all the people at the Calcutta South Club who were part and parcel of me growing up. We were there every day practicing. People like Praveen Singh, Naushir Madden, Chiradeep Mukherjee, Bidyut Goswami. They were all the icons of the game at the time who were so instrumental in me wanting to play so much more. And at the end, Mahesh, Leander, Sanya, you know, all the people I sort of helped in my life. You know, they, they, they've been amazing memories. And uh, at the end, you know, All India Tennis Association, uh, Bengal Tennis Association for supporting me. I guess if I have a regret is the fact that I was never honored with an Arjuna Award or a Dronacharya Award so far. And uh, I sort of think I've, I've sort of ach uh, achieved enough to have sort of merited at least one of these awards, which I never received. So if there's a regret, that's it. But beyond that, you know, it's all been a big positive. You, you can't regret, Rico, something that you can't control. But what is more important is that there are people around who recognize what you've done and who appreciate what you've done. And I think that is a huge award and reward in itself. And, uh, you know, I uh, share all your sentiments. I wish you the very best of luck from the Calcutta Parsi Club, uh, from all the guys who played tennis with us. And from me personally, it's been a privilege to have met you, although I've only known you for the last 10 or 12 years. But I have known of your career and following your career for a very long time. Great to have you on the show, Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Yesli. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Rico. Take care. Stay well. Stay safe. Thank you. Here comes the sun, and I say, it's alright.